What a great movement to be part of. What a great family to be part of. I just want to, um, as we start, I'm just going to, again, give a big shout out to all the people who are graduating this afternoon. The boot camp people, so excited about that. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you. Uh, so right after lunch, what we're going to do after lunch is we'll take, we'll have a shorter lunch break, and then we're going to launch 50 books, 50 plus books. The newest authors in East Africa and Africa are going to be launched right here. I think uh, we probably have graduated, maybe this is going to be like the, the 210th person will graduate today uh, from the boot camp. And uh, those are all authors, by the way, every single one of them. Some of them are multiple authors. And uh, wow, we are changing. This is how we change the thinking of our community. When we start to write down, put all our thoughts down, and begin to influence. So I'm going to be, we're going to celebrate, we're going to launch their books, and then we're going to have a graduation. I don't know if there are any family members who've come because of those who are graduating. You're not normally here, but you're here for those who are graduating. Can we give a big shout out to all the family members? Wow. <laughs> We're so excited. So grateful that you're here and that you can be part of us as we're doing this graduation. It's going to be so much fun. I'm also a parent, by the way. By the way, I'm so proud. I'm a parent of a graduate today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, God is such a good, God, God is such a good uh, God because I, I did the internship at Nairobi Chapel when I was 18, and that was when my journey of ministry started. And so I'm proud that today my daughter is also about to graduate from her internship. So she's a second generation uh, intern, a second generation uh, trained by Mavuno, by, by Mavuno on Nairobi Chapel, this movement of churches. And so I believe God, God is in the business of generations. His faithfulness is from generation to generation. And so I'm very, very proud. Thanks for reminding me about that, sweetie, that I'm also a proud parent. Come on. Come on. So um, because of that, I want to talk. I, I'm going to just try and hone this down. Uh, and then we're going to have this session. We'll do the graduation, and then we'll do our final prayer time. But I want, to, I want to hone down and kind of bring this to a close by talking about something that I think is a natural outcome of all the things we've talked about. We've talked about the fact that the people who know their God, we're living in difficult times and we're living in times that are going to need a certain kind of Christian, the kind of people who know their God who shall be strong and do exploits. And we talked about what that actually means. If you missed it, I think it's going to be up on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, you want to hear it because it helps you make sense, not only of what the scriptures say that gave us a theme verse for this year, but also of what is happening globally and how we fit into it. Because there's a place that God, prophecy is not just there for you to just uh, think it's, be impressed. God predicted the times we're living in. But the one thing I'll tell you about prophecy that's very interesting. I told you that out of the maybe 300 and whatever prophecies, uh, no, 135 prophecies in the Daniel 11, that almost all of them have been fulfilled. A um, couple of things. The, the ones that haven't been fulfilled, I really believe have to do with the final Antichrist. Because we learned about Antiochus, the fourth Epiphanes. He called himself God Manifest. By the way, by the time he died of his illness, the nickname had changed from Epiphanes to Epimanes. Epiphanes means God Manifest. Epimanes means the mad one. This is what happens to those who try to defy the living God. He was the most powerful ruler in his day, but he died as the mad one. Uh, but there is another Antichrist that will come. And those are the few verses. There are a few verses that don't apply to Antiochus in Daniel 11. I'm, I'm giving you a curiosity so you read it for yourself. And those actually, I believe, refer to the end times. And what we talked about, is, and the other thing that you want to understand about prophecy, prophecy is very interesting. Prophecy is actually cyclical. There are some things that were prophesied that were actually fulfilled, but they will still be fulfilled. So they were partially fulfilled, but then they will be fulfilled. When you read the book of Revelation, you see some of the things that Daniel prophesied about that actually got fulfilled, but it talks about the fact that the time is coming for them to be fulfilled. And so even the things we're talking about, we're saying that these are times, we're living in biblical times, and because of that, we must be the people who know their God. The idea of prophecy is not so that you can sit down and feel pretty, I know the year Jesus is coming back, no. The reason for prophecy is so that you can be found as a workman who is fully approved. 
one who understands the times and is able to be found doing what the master wants him to be doing. And if we know that the times are coming to an, to an end, then what we do is we start doing the master's work seriously because we know he could come any time and darkness is coming and we soon may not be able to share the gospel the way we do. And so we talked about that. We talked about the fact that we must be leaders who give permission. Uh, Pastor Godman, and I'm going, to, I'm going to tie in a bit of what he talked about in my last session. And then we talked about the fact that we, uh, we must pray. Uh, if we want to become ready, those people who know their God, it always starts with prayer. There's no such thing as a gospel movement, uh, taking the gospel across the world without prayer. Prayer is the boiler room. It always starts in prayer. Prayer is where the engine uh, works for you to become a world-changing uh, Christian, a person who follows Jesus and changes the world. And then this morning we talked about the fact that, hey, what's our fruitfulness? Even the purpose of this prayer is to make us fruitful, which means that our lives have impact and that people know Jesus because of us. That's why we are put here on earth. You know, you could have gotten saved, you could have gone to heaven the minute you got saved. In fact, the reality is you should have been in God's presence the minute you said that prayer. Dear Jesus, I accept you uh, from now on. Devil, I refuse you in Jesus' name. Nana, boom, you're gone. <laughs> you're gone. You should be in heaven. Uh, because really, there's nothing you're going to do on earth that will make you go to heaven more. You already are qualified to heaven once you pray that prayer. Your, your destiny is assured. That's the funny thing about following Jesus. Unlike any religion in the world where you have to keep working out or, or, or working for your salvation. When you follow Jesus, your salvation has already worked for you. Now you're working out of the salvation. Uh, you're already guaranteed. If you died right now, if there's an earthquake right now and this tent fell and all of us died, we'd go straight to heaven. You just need to understand that. There's, no, there's, no, there's nothing else you'd have to do. So why were you left on earth? is such you can make disciples, you can share the gospel, you can be fruitful. You can be fruitful. The Bible tells us one day we're going to rule and reign in eternity with Jesus. Revelation 22, 10, 21, at the end of the book of Revelation. We will rule in eternity. I don't understand that. There's some things even my mind can't comprehend. What does it mean that I will rule in eternity forever and ever with the master Jesus? What does that mean? It talks about the fact that angels were actually created to become my PA. So I'm going to have some authority, some supernatural, eternal authority. I'm going to have an angel. In fact, uh, somebody was telling us yesterday, at least two. I think it was Pastor James. His theology tells him at least there'll be two for him, uh, for everyone. So it's like I'm going to have my PAs and their angels. And then there's a role I was created for that I have no clue about right now. But Jesus gives us a parable to, to just tell us, you know, those who are faithful in little will be given responsibility over to govern cities. That's all I know. That whatever I'm doing right now is completely little compared to what I'm being trained for. And my faithfulness in doing the Lord's work in the season is what qualifies me. It's what trains me, rather, for what is coming. Oh, my goodness. Like, I can't, I, can't, I can't believe what heaven's going to be like. It's like, I'm going to get there. You see, some people think that heaven is, is like you're sitting on a cloud and angels are strumming harps and you're plopping grapes into your mouth. It's like this place where you just sleep the whole day. No, 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 no. The Bible says, they shall reign forever and ever. It's speaking about you and I. So heaven is a place where there will be work. But it's a rulership work. And right now, everything that God is taking us through, the prayer the evangelist, all that is just training us, the spiritual man, for the role that is ahead for us. So this is what we're talking about, the people who know their God. I'm just giving you the, the clues. This is how you become the person who knows their God. You're a prayer warrior, and you are a fruitful Christian. The other thing I want to talk about, and this will be like my, my last one then, is that you also have to be a multiplier. And it's a, it's a logical consequence of those two. You have to be a multiplying leader. The vision of the boot camp is actually to produce 5,000 kingdom multiplying leaders. Yeah, these are the people we are graduating, 5,000. And, and that's the, 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 the defined objective of that program is to take 5,000 people through it and turn them into multiplying kingdom leaders. So I'm going to talk about multi being a multiplying leader. And I want to ask you a question. Who is one person in your life who believed in you and helped you accomplish more than you could have imagined? <laughs> no, think about the question first. 
who is one person who believed in you and helped you accomplish more than you thought you were capable of? I want you to actually share that with your neighbor. Just tell them a name of somebody. Somebody in your life who believed in you and helped you accomplish more than you thought you were capable of accomplishing. Just think about it. Just one person. And by the way, if there was no one, just be real and say, me, I didn't have anyone like that. I just happened. <laughs> I'm here despite of the bad leaders I've had in my life. One person who believed in you and helped you accomplish more than you could have ever imagined. One person who believed in you. And then let your neighbor also tell them, tell you on their part, somebody who invested in them, believed in them, helped them become somebody like they would never have imagined they were capable of being. Awesome. All right. Let me see. How many said a teacher? Somebody, put it up loud and proud. All right. I can see a few people. Your teacher called out something in you. Maybe the career you're in right now, the life choices you've made were because of a teacher. How many, it was your par a parent? Let me just see. Wow. Parents, I hope you're looking around. That's the power of parenting. Like somebody said, my parent is who inputted into my life. Helped me become everything. I never thought they spoke into me. They believed in me when I couldn't believe in myself. How many people so said uh, a sports coach? Let me see, sports coach. Yeah? Wow. There's a few people. That's awesome. I had a sports coach who really helped me achieve things I never thought I could achieve. So I, I feel for those people. How many people said a, per a pastor? A pastor? Okay, I can see somebody said Pastor M at least. One pastor in the room, I'm happy. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Bless God. Somebody believed in you. For some of you, it was that pastor who kicked you in the back into the, into the pool of crocodiles. <laughs> and you swam for dear life. And look at who you are today. Somebody believed in you. Now, how many of you, I mean, had nobody. I mean, nobody's actually done that for you yet. And you've looked at people who did that and you wished you had somebody. Let me just see show of hands. Because there's always people, yeah, there's a few people who are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish I'd had somebody who poured into me. I never had anyone like that. I've sort of grown up without that. Yeah, there's always people in that space. And you know what? If that's you, I'm happy you're here. Because it ain't over. Your life is not over. It's brought you here. God has brought you here. And I believe you will find that person in this place. You know, for my sweetie and I, my, 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 my beautiful sweetie. <laughs> but I like making fun of her. You know, when, when you're a young couple, if your husband preaches about you and makes a bad joke about you, he knows by the time he gets home, he's in trouble. <laughs> Pastor James, there's sometimes I see you, I mention my wife, I see you look at me with such like, because he, oh, he doesn't get in trouble anymore. Yeah, right. <laughs> the kaya the he gave was very half-hearted, Pastor Dorcas. <laughs> but you know, when you've been married for almost 30 years like we have, you, you're like, we, we can laugh about small things, by the way. So... But you know, we've come a long way. And one of the things that really helped us as a young couple, and I can't, I cannot say how privileged we were. I almost could say the word lucky if I believed in luck. But I think God blessed us so strongly. He put us in a church where there were many older, many older couples. And we were like students. Actually, we were students, uh, university students. And we were a group of us. And these older people just sort of adopted us like their children. So we were serving in the worship team. Uh, we were doing some of the ministries in the church. We were in our teens, late teens. Uh, they were probably mostly in their almost late 20s, early 30s. Um, and so because they were there, they sort of became like our parents. And we had the privilege as a group, we got into our pastor's house a lot uh, as we served and we did ministry. Sometimes we'd, be, we'd carry things from church to his house and then we'd sit down and have lunch with his wife. And we'd just hang out with them. 
We had the privilege of babysitting their kids, uh, our pastor's kids. And we had, it was so interesting because we learned so much about parenting. Like literally, like everything. Like later on, we did classes in parenting. But it was so amazing because by the time we were doing the classes, we already had seen the practicals. It wasn't theory for us. We could see how they brought up their kids. We learned how to just be a couple. Like I think the friendship we have just came from being around couples who are friends. And just seeing, oh wow, this is how you do it. It's not like our parents had an impact on us, but it was something to learn. It's one thing to learn from our parents, it's something to learn from somebody who's closer to your age, who you look up to. You know, at a certain age, you look up to people who are those cool uncles and aunties. And these people became that for us. And we did ministry with them. We looked after children. We, 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 we went out and just had conversations with them. We didn't know we were being discipled at the time. We didn't realize it. Even my friends, none of us realized it. But actually, our lives were being changed completely for the better. And it was interesting because for Pastor Kara and I, we've taught so many things. When we teach our courses, many times we teach things that we just learned from those people, from our pastor and his wife, but also from some of the other couples that God allowed to be in our lives, who are still our friends until today, and who we still talk to um, until today. I mean, the other day we were in... Uh, on holiday and we were with some, one of our mentor couples and their kids are all in their, would you say, in their 30s now. And they started talking and we removed our notebooks. Because uh-huh. like, oh, that's how parenting is when your kids are in your 30s. Because it's like we don't know. But isn't it beautiful that we have someone ahead of us who we can actually take out our notebooks and say, aha, these are the mistakes you made that we don't have to make also. And so by God's grace, we had somebody. We are, we are so privileged we had a coach in fact, for us, we had several coaches who helped us become what we are today. You know, there's a critical need in our world today for leaders who raise other leaders. Leaders who are permission givers to other leaders. Yet in our culture, it's a threatening concept for some reason. I don't know, maybe it's just in Africa, but I believe it's actually not just here. But you know, it, the, the issue of raising up younger leaders can be a very lip, it's given lip service. But people don't actually believe in it. And this is in corporates, in gov- governments, in churches, in our homes. We grew up in a generation that was told in Kenya that we were the, the leaders of tomorrow. Yeah, my generation was told we are the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, but you know what? I think the leaders of my generation who became leaders had to fight to become leaders. Because it's, and it's still, even today, we are still the leaders of tomorrow. So now if my generation were the leaders of tomorrow, how about your generation? You'll never be leaders, you know. It's, such a, it's, it, it's just this thing where there isn't an ease of passing leadership to the next generation. Why do most leaders struggle to raise other leaders? I'm just talking about maybe in our culture, but maybe you've seen it in the, in the workplace. Maybe you've seen it uh, in leadership. Why is it that leaders struggle to raise other leaders? I was just thinking about it this morning. I mean, we had one president in this country who declared a successor. Only one, and that was President Moi. He's the only one who said, this Kijana is the one who's taking over from me. We even voted out that Kijana at that time. Nobody else has ever said that. All our leaders leave office fighting for it, and the ones who never get office stay stay fighting for the rest of their lives. And people die fighting for that presidency. And nobody's willing to say, this guy now should be the one to step into my shoes. Why is it that leaders struggle? to pass on authority to the next generation of leaders. Again, have a small conversation with your neighbor. Just help me here. It's good for us to share some wisdom this this morning because I believe that God wants us to be multiplying leaders, but our culture stops us from being that. Why do leaders struggle to pass on authority to other leaders? In the business world, in the marketplace, corporate world, in government, in churches, in homes. Do I have a mic that I can hear a few answers? We just get some, some wisdom from, from these fearless people. Yeah, maybe, maybe, a, maybe a couple of you have shared already 
might have had a good answer from your neighbor or you have a good answer. Why, do, why have you seen? Some of you even are in corporate, you've seen these struggles. What's happening? Why is it so difficult? All right. I think uh, we've got a few people with the mics. Okay. Let's start with you, Philip. Maybe you can just stand and just uh, share. Maybe tell, tell us who you are and what network, and then you can share. Uh, that mic isn't on. Is it on? Not yet. G give him the other one. Yeah. See, what what's an Ishika Zoteka politician? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> have I have plenty. Um, my name is Philip Bugigi uh, oh, from Hill City Network, <laughs> and uh, we currently lead Mavuno Praise, which is Mavuno Kitengela. Come on, come on. Yeah, uh, and I'm a permission giving leader, so <laughs> don't be worried. <laughs> so uh, one of one of the things we are discussing about is people fear that when when I let when when I groom you to be a leader that will be greater than me, and the other thing is that why are they scared of you becoming greater? Uh, one of the things is because most of the time we lead from a selfish point. So when I'm leading. I'm actually expecting that my leadership will cater for my needs. So whoever is uh -huh. coming after me, I don't think is catering for my needs. Able to cater for my needs. <laughs> that is that So is basically if I raise you, you might take my position. Yes. And that position is what I'm relying on. Yes, and that is what I'm protecting because And I have to protect my position. Yes. All right. That's a good one. So so basically I think we see that in corporate many times. It's like if I mentor a young leader and they might be cheaper. In fact, they're cheaper than me. The company might say, this one and this one can give the same, and this one is cheaper because they're not as experienced. And I might lose my job because I raised somebody behind me. Anybody have seen, have seen something like that in corporate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of the professional bodies in our country are geared around protecting the profession from young upstarts. Okay, we won't go into that. Uh, so, who was next? There's somebody with the mic already? Yeah. If, I don't see you. Okay, yeah, please. What's happening with our mics? Do like a politician. Check, check, check. Oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Milka Kithinji. I'm from the Downtown Network. Come on, come on. So, um, why leaders, we're just discussing here, why leaders find it hard to raise others? It's because once you're in that position, yeah. You think of it as a legacy you want to leave, not for any other people, but for your own family. So you think that, um, or you see it from a point where only people who are your blood or lineage are capable ah. of providing that kind of leadership. Yeah. So if anyone else has a gifting but is not in your lineage, you'd want to suppress them or better still make sure they don't get to see the light of day. Wow. So that then you have the people who listen to you, who, you know, the ones you can control, even if you're not seated on the seat, uh -huh. to do what you want. So you've gotten to the point of the matter, because the point is not that they're related to me. The point is I can control them. Yes. I want people who I can control after I'm no longer in power. Yes. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Wow. Let's appreciate somebody different. All right. I can see somebody standing over there. Yeah, we need to hear your, life, your, your network's name. Praise God. Come on. Bob. Uh, my name is Bob Collins from, <laughs> from the Lifeway Network. Yeah, we, we, we were discussing that uh, a lot of leaders, it's because of ego that they don't want to raise up other leaders. And it's because they want to be demigods and they just want a little. A, bit of minions that they can control. So they won't want someone else to challenge that authority that they have. Yet they won't know that these other people will just complement what they have. And that is something that I've lived through. So they want, you want power. The guy wants power. They want the power. power. Wants power yeah. They want power. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they feel threatened. And you have some pain stories there. Not, not the pain stories, but now a story of a leader who raised me 
to supplement what they lacked and showed me the other side of ah, being raised up. Nice, yeah. nice. I love it. Yeah, Thank Mr. you, Mr. Frederick Muteti. Yeah. Come on, come on. <laughs> I love it. Should we, should we hear from somebody from the South or Mashariki Network? Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello. Are you in the South <gasps> or Mashariki Network? Just, just wait first. Let's okay. first hear from the Mashariki okay. Network. Okay. They'll, they'll catch feelings. They'll catch feelings. No, I'll, I'll let you have the bonus. All right. Check. <laughs> Check. Mashariki, eh? <laughs> Mashariki, ah! He's a politician right there. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, that is quite a profound uh, question, uh, Pastor M. But one of the things I would like to mention concerning um, leadership is, firstly, there's an aspect of revenge. Ah, revenge. Yes. Okay. Um, especially if your leadership has been very poor. Sorry. If your leadership has been very poor mm. and you know that someone is going to come after you, and they're going to deal with you the way uh -huh. you have dealt with the people. Uh -huh. And so some of them will want to hold as much as possible on the, on, on the title. So the I thought. fear because I know that I may have oppressed people, yes, you've made oppressed unpopular people, decisions. And yes, when you step down, you and Somebody your might will come become after victims. Me. Uh -huh. You and all your cronies who have been responsible of um, making sure... <laughs> Come on, cronies. <laughs> I love it. And, I love and, it. and there's also another aspect of um, you're so used to the parks of, Aha. of staying in you that like position. You like the parks of power. Yes. You that you're not going to become a typical normal guy after you relinquish the power. I like it. Uh, one, of our, one of our good friends is actually one of our relatives. Uh, I call her one of our aunties. She was a mother's union um, chairman. And she told us she stopped going to church when she stopped being the chair lady. When we asked her, she said, I had my own parking spot. She said, it's hard, to, it's hard to stop being used to these things when you have them. And it's true with our politicians. You're used to that car, Mercedes. You're used to the chase car. You're used to people calling you the title they call you. Eish. By the way, let's, let's, you know, the only reason you're not feeling this one is because you've not been there. Let me tell you. Somebody from South Network. All right, let's hear. So who is that suppressing the South Network? Who? Huh? We can't. These people are trying to, huh? money has been poured. Hi, yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, hi. hi. From South Network, my name is Angela Mugo from Mabuno Rongai. I serve. Um, for us, two things we're actually discussing is one. Power is sweet. Oh, there we go. Power is sweet. So, where you feel like um, when you're in a space of power, you have the respect, you have the honor, you have the cars, etc., etc. Yeah, so, that yeah. then gives you power is sweet. The second one is something I realized is the fear of loneliness, where <laughs> used to having people around you. Uh -huh. Around you because you have access to power. Yeah. So without yeah. that, then you're afraid. Will I still have the same people? Yeah. What a thing to say! It's so true. Yeah. They say, by the way, that the minute the day you're fired, or the day you resign from that job, and they have the party for you, your phone stops ringing. It goes silent, and nobody calls you. And most of the people I've had being interviewed say that they start looking at their phone to see is there a problem with the network? Is my is my phone not being picked? Is my phone, is it that people are, is it, has somebody hacked my phone? Why, why, have, why are there no messages? But people moved on to the next person. And when you lose that position, it can be lonely. Now, it's very interesting. I was thinking about all these things when it comes to us and our own leadership. But it's very interesting because as I thought about some of the reasons that we don't like to share Lead, uh, uh, leadership and to pass it on. One could be, a, is, is maybe some of you even said a superstar mentality. 
where you feel like, I worked for what I have and I deserve it. Yeah, I worked hard to get here and I deserve this. And anyway, nobody below me will do it as well as I can. Like, I know, by the way, and this one I think many people can identify. When I do it, I know how I like it done. If I pass it on to somebody else, they will probably never do it as well as I can. Yeah, is, is it true? Yeah, yeah, and because of that, many times you're like, let me just do it for myself. Let me just keep it, you know? Number two, we fear competition. Somebody say that. I might raise somebody only for them to betray me and to become my competition. And this happens in companies. You take an intern, you train them, and then they go and open their own company. And then they become your first competitor. And because of that, many times we're afraid. It's like, if I raise this person, they could end up becoming a competitor for me. They could end up performing better than me in the company. They could end up becoming the person everybody's talking about. Saul has slain his thousands. And David's tens of thousands. It's like, why, why do I want people to be, to, 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 to be talking about this person? Let them see me. Let them celebrate me and not this young person. Another one maybe because, oh, here's, a, here's an interesting one that nobody mentioned. Sometimes it's because we fear overloading other people. As leaders. There's an assumption we sometimes have as leaders that if I don't like these tasks, nobody else likes them anyway. So I hate admin. But I do it because I'm like, ah, if I give them, they also don't like it. So we get to the place where I'm like, I'm trying to protect the people who follow me. So I end up doing all the work. And there are a lot of leaders who are in that position. I'm talking about good leaders at Mavuno now. I'm not talking about those evil ones out there. <laughs> like I'm holding on to all the responsibilities in the DG because I don't want to overburden people. And if I give them the responsibility, they might not even come next week. They might burn. They look busy. Ah, I'm talking to good people now. They're hearing these ones. <laughs> yeah, another one is because we are not taught how to do it. We're not taught how to delegate. Some of us, we are very good at doing the thing ourselves. But we don't have the skill of passing the thing to someone else. And so you're a, you're, whenever you're putting, you're a star. You know how to shine. But whenever you're leading people, you don't know how to lead people. Because it's, another, it's one thing to do something well. It's another thing to pass on something to somebody else. Yeah. So you're a phenomenal DG leader. But you don't know how to hand over that DG to somebody else. You lead your company well. But the minute you step out of the door, it stops performing. Yeah. And you don't know how to hand it over. So sometimes it's ignorance that keeps us from handing. And some of us don't go and leave. <laughs> yeah, some of you, by the way, I know you. You don't go and leave. And when you go, they only, they only allow you to go and leave so long as your phone is on. Because you're the only one who knows how that machine works. I don't trust anybody else near those books. Yeah. Another one is are found with people is because you don't think you have something worth passing on to others. You actually look at it and you but what but I, what I do is so simple. Like seriously, I mean it's like I don't have anything I could teach someone. So it's easy to, you know what I'm saying is it's easy to see the big ones of oh power is sweet, all the big ones that we see because we see them out there but we don't realize we also have reasons why we struggle to pass on authority to others around us. And some of these reasons keep us small. They keep our campuses small. They keep our discipleship groups small. They keep our ministries small. They keep whatever responsibility God gives you small. Some of you right now, you're running small companies that God ordained to be global companies. But they will never be global as long as your thinking is restricted to you. And unless you learn to hand over and become a multiplying leader. This is the only way. And I believe that God wants us to be multiplying leaders. Because it's easy for us to point out. By the way, at one point, I stopped pointing at politicians. I stopped pointing at, at, at presidents and calling them bad leaders. And the reason is because at one point, I began to realize I'm also a leader. And many times when I point, I've got other fingers pointing right at me. I've got three of the fingers are pointing at me. And then one at God, eh? <laughs> the one who I'm blaming for all the problems. <laughs> yeah, when you start to realize, by the way, let me just say, when you start to understand leadership and become a leader, 
you become very empathetic towards other leaders. I see presidents and the issues they have, and I'm like, I can see their problems. I, but I also don't know the whole situation. It's easy for me to, say, to tell President Museveni how to run Uganda. Anybody, by the way, all of Uganda knows how to run Uganda better than the president. Every, all the Kenyans know how to run Kenya better than President Ruto. Every Kenyan can tell him. By, all of us know, by the way. All of us know better. Yeah, it's true. Am I, am I lying? Any Kenyan on Twitter can run this country better than the president of the time. Yeah, we are all, we are all Twitter presidents. Yeah. But I've learned to be humble because I have people that I lead in the office who know my job better than me. It's just a reality. That's how it works. I have children at home in my house who I lead who probably have theories of how they'll become better parents. And some of them are probably correct, by the way. <laughs> yeah. But I, I'm a leader, and my leadership is shown by the people around me. And, 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 and guys, there's no excuse for this one. The people around you display your leadership. It's what shows your leadership. It's, you can build a great institution, build a fantastic leading company, but it's the people around you, the kind of people you surround you with, that show you what kind of leader you are. Do you have successors in place? If you are to drop dead today, God forbid. Actually, why should God forbid? Paul said it is better for you to die. <laughs> You'll be in heaven. There'll be a party waiting for you. But if you are to die today, would your legacy thrive or would it be quickly forgotten? Would people move on and in the next few months, nobody even remembers you are there? Or would your legacy live on? Maybe you're thinking, I don't have anything to pass on to others. Maybe you're saying, I'm just a student. I'm just a junior employee where I work. I'm just a small-time business person. I'm just a young guy. But let me just say this. God's Word teaches us something different. It teaches us something very different. I want to, I want to point you to a leader today who I think is a leader worth commending and a leader worth following. And his name was Moses, one of the most influential national leaders who ever lived. But I believe from Moses we can learn how to run even our businesses. We can learn how to run the NGOs that we lead. We can run our families differently by just understanding something about this great man. It says in Deuteronomy 31 verse 1 to 8, Then Moses went out and spoke these words to all of Israel. I am now 120 years old. And no longer able to lead you. The Lord has said to me, you shall not cross the Jordan. The Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. So God had told Moses, that's it. It's time for you to finish. And he says, the Lord himself will cross over ahead for you. He will destroy these nations before you. You can imagine the guy who's talking is the guy who's been the leader of these Israelites since they were kids. Because all the old ones had died. So the ones who were there were all under 40 except Joshua and, his, and, and Caleb. And he's the only leader they've known all these years. And he says in verse 4, The Lord will do to them what he did to Sihon and Og, the kings of Amorites, who he destroyed along with their land. The Lord will deliver them to you, and you must do to them all that I've commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes before you. He will never leave you or forsake you. So this is a, a permission-giving leader. He's blessing them. He's not saying, you guys are going to miss me. One day you'll wake up and wonder where I am. I know you looked at me badly. <laughs> He's not saying that. He's like, God will help you. You will prosper. You will do greater things than I did. And then verse 7, Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you must go with these people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them. And you must divide it among them as their inheritance. In other words, you're the one who will be in charge of the inheritance going forward. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. This was Moses' final speech to a nation he had led for over 40 years. And he was introducing the next leader of Israel. It's very easy, and I used to think, that maybe the only reason Moses had to pick Joshua is because at 120 years old, the Lord told him, you can't lead anymore. And so now he was forced to pick someone else. And it's very easy to assume he made the decision to pick someone else because he had no other option. But you'd be very mistaken if you thought that. 
Because the Bible tells us, if you do, by the way, if you do a word search on Joshua, you'll find out he'd been in the story for a long, long time. Numbers 11, 28. It tells us he had been at Moses' side for a long time. Numbers 11, 28. Can you put that verse up? It says, Joshua, son of Nun, who had been Moses' aid since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. Now, just a bit of clarity. It's not talking about Moses' youth. Because Moses came back to Israel when he was 80. <laughs> so it's actually talking about Joshua's youth. And you're saying when Joshua was a kid, he was hanging around Moses. Like when Moses just came back and he was talking to the Pharaoh and he's saying, come on, let my people go. There's a young kid who's hanging around. And when Joshua, when Moses starts leading the people across the Red Sea, there's a young kid called Joshua who's growing up at that time, a youth, and he's at Moses' side. And if you read the scriptures after that, you're going to find that there were certain things about Joshua that were really attractive. I want to put this to you. As you're looking for a successor, because you're a Moses as well. Yeah? Come on, Moses. You're a leader of God's people. There are certain things that you will look for in a successor. This, apply this in your discipleship groups, by the way. My prayer, by the way, apply this in your discipleship. Look for the Joshua's in your discipleship group. Look for the people you're going to raise up around you. Everywhere, every responsibility God gives you, you should always be looking for your Joshua's. The first thing that you look for in a successor is faithfulness. He was faithful. It tells us in Exodus 17.9 that when Moses needed a battle fought, he says to, the, he said to, the Israel, he said to Joshua, he spoke to Joshua, he said, <laughs> Moses said to Joshua, Exodus 17, 9, Choose some of our men, go to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Joshua was a faithful man. Moses told him, choose some of the men. You notice Moses didn't say, choose this one and this one and this one. He knew if I give this man a responsibility, tomorrow I can show up in my place of prayer. The army will be ready. That's a faithful leader. He's somebody who, when they're given an instruction, they follow it. When they're given a role to play, they are faithful to it. When you say we're hosting DG tomorrow, they, they're there. And they're ready. You, you tell them tomorrow we're going out for outreach, they're there early. And you tell them, I want you to be the one who makes the flyers, they've made them. This is a faithful person. They're dependable. Are there people around you who are dependable? Yeah. God has already, I put it to you, God has already begun to show you some Joshua's in your life. The dependable leaders who are there. You know, Moses was not able to fight. He was very interesting. He was 80. It wasn't even his role to fight. There are some people who are 80 and they are still in the battlefield. And I'm not talking about 80 in age. You could be 80 in the experience God has given you in leadership. But you're still out there being the one to fight the battles. As opposed to understanding your role now is to step aside and let the Joshua's fight. And you're there coaching. You're there praying. You're their blessing. Moses understood that this was his role. And listen, Joshua had different gifts. He was eager to fight. Never assume that the things that drain you will drain the people around you. This was something that somebody taught me in leadership a long time ago. Just because you don't like administration, don't assume that the people around you don't like it. Inevitably, there's somebody with a different gift from you that will love the thing you don't enjoy. As a good leader, you need to find the 5% that nobody else can do in that organization. And focus on doing just that. The other 95%, I bet you somebody who God has put in your life can do. So look for that faithful person. And Moses knew there's a faithful young man called Joshua. Stop limiting your ministry. Stop limiting your life by working alone. If you're a Moses, you need to look for your faithful Joshua's. Can I speak to the Joshua's also? Joshua's, be faithful. Yeah, because many of us are Joshua's in that situation right now. You're a member of a DG. You're a new person in a ministry. You're helping a leader to do something in that compass. Be a faithful Joshua. Be one of those that can be looked at and they say, this one has been around faithful since their youth. Be a faithful Joshua. Number two, Joshua was available. Joshua was available. It's interesting, when Moses went up to the mountain to get Ten Commandments, we always know that Moses went up to the mountain but we often forget he didn't go alone. Exodus 32 verse 17, 
he was with somebody called Joshua. The Bible says when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. There's a party going on. People are doing a, a, a big hang and eating and they're drinking and they have slaughtered cows. But there's a young man who chooses to be with his leader. Fasting. Because Moses is fasting in the, as people are eating cows and they're they they having parties. He's a young man who chooses to follow his leader. He's available for his leader. You know, there's some people, by the way, who around you who make you feel like they are God's gift to you. They act like your ministry is lucky to have them. You're lucky to have a qualified person like me in your discipleship group. I'm such a busy person. You know, when I show up, I can show up. But you guys are lucky when you get 30 minutes of my time every Wednesday. Yeah, there are people who are like that, by the way. They're just not available. Yeah, they're not available. And it's not, I mean, it's just the thing that they've, again, not understood ultimate reality. Their reality is being dictated by other things except the kingdom priorities. But I put it to you, God has put some Joshua's in your life. They're there. You know, sometimes we're looking for the gifted person and God is asking you, look for the available person. Invest in this one. This one who likes being around you, invite them in. This one who has nothing else they're doing except, you know, sometimes you look at this one, you're like, ah, this one has nothing better to do. Let me look for the busy one. Because they look like they're more gifted. And they're, uh-uh. Look for the available leader. So Moses, there's some available leaders around you. Call them into the space. Create opportunities for them to serve. And for the Joshua's, learn to be available. Learn to be available. There's something we learned this last two years called tarrying. Yeah. But there's some of you know how to tarry. I've been to some of the campuses. Life where you guys know how to tarry. I love it. I love, I love guys. Tarrying is just that space when you understand that when you hang out and you move past the formal into the informal space, that sometimes your life will not be changed by the sermon that was preached. It may be something that your leader says to you as you walk him to the car. And in that space, as you tarry, something happened. You know, it's very interesting uh, with, with our discipleship group. They know how to tarry. Many times after we finish family night, we hang out. I mean, sometimes these guys want to kick them out of our house. Like it's 11 and I go home. But it's like we, some of our best conversations have actually happened after our DG time is over. As we're just hanging out and just talking, enjoying each other's company, God puts a word and we just start sharing deep things. I think last week, this last weekend of Wednesday, I remember we were talking and I shared with them one of the most devastating experiences I had in my life. A time when I thought somebody in authority over me had taken advantage over me, a father. And I was so disappointed and so angry until my spiritual father told me, go and apologize to them. They're in authority over you. <laughs> and I told them how I cried, how I was so bitter. And I, I mean, it was such a, it was such a, a raw moment that I had not planned. We'd never have, they'd never have had that story if they left immediately the DG was over. If everybody just rushed off. But as you just hang out in those unhurried times together, something begins to happen. And it was such a, for me, it was such an interesting story because I remember when my wife, when we got home, she said, I think that's why we met today. He saw that story could be told because I think it's an important story for all their lives. Learn to tarry. Joshua, be available. Be available. When you come to past, Pastor Kuria's house and Pastor Joe has cooked a meal, yeah, hang out. Don't just say it's time to go and leave. Go and, go and wash dishes with Pastor Jojo. I think as you're just helping there and you're hanging out, something could happen in that space that could change your life forever. So, Joshua, be available. Tell your neighbor, be available. Number three, teachable. When Moses went again to meet God face to face, guess who was there with him? Joshua. This is after the Ten Commandments are destroyed and Moses goes up. The Kayanga is still there. I don't think Moses could chase him away, by the way. I think this guy was just like, I'm with you. Where you go, I am going. What you do, I am doing. So Moses goes up again and they leave the people in the camp and Joshua knows we were, the last time we were here for 40 days and we didn't eat. <laughs> guess what? We are there. I love, I love um, Pastor James, not here, but he has some young guys. Uh, Pastor James, I told you, he, did a, he was doing, the last weekend, he did like five-hour prayers, two days. Five hours on Saturday, five hours on Sunday. 
But what is exciting for me is that he has some disciples in this church who are there praying those five hours with him. They're just like, yeah, I'm there. Pastor James, I want to learn how you pray. If you're praying for five hours, I'm coming to pray with you. Uh -uh, those are teachable people. You want teachable people in your life. There are some people, by the way, when you start teaching them, they start looking bored. <laughs> yeah, because they, they think they know already. And they, they don't, I mean, they, they look like this when you're talking. Like, you impress me. And you get stressed as a teacher because you're like, this one, there's nothing I can teach them, by the way. There's nothing I can teach them. Let me tell you this. One of the things that really has amazed me is I know people who've known the Lord for years. But when they come to Mavuno, there are people who are much older than me. When they come to Mavuno, I look at them and they've opened their notebook and they're taking notes. And I'm like, my God, you should be the one teaching me. Like, 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 you're the one who taught me what I know. How are you taking notes when I'm preaching? But there's just a hunger to learn from them. They're teachable leaders. And I believe it's because that's the reason God has propelled them up in the spiritual realm the way he has. I want to be a teachable leader. I never want to feel like I know, like I've arrived. Even if a child is teaching, I want to be there taking notes. As long as they're teaching God's word, I believe there's something I'll hear that I've never heard before. So just be hungry to learn. And it was interesting because uh, <laughs> Exodus 33, 11 tells us, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Like, Joshua is like, okay, you just be going. I'm he just wants to be in the presence of God. He's like, man, I enjoy being in this space. Like, God is teaching. My goodness, I, I don't even want to go back. I want to be in the presence. I just want to learn. He was hungry. Is it a sh are you shocked that Joshua was picked as the next leader of Israel? Already you can see the qualities that were just setting him apart from his generation. All the other young men are in the camp, but there's one who's just like, I want to be in the presence of God. I want to be in the tent uh, when Moses is there and when he leaves. So if you're a Moses, come on, Moses. Look for teachable Joshuas. There's some teachable young people around you. They may not be the ones you're looking at. There's some who are teachable. They like learning. They have questions. They're leaning forward. And Joshua's in the house. Be teachable. Be teachable. By the way, approach every leader, every person teaching you like you don't know. Like you assume you don't know. And you'll be shocked to discover, my goodness, there are things I've learned just by being around this person. Where is, where is Jokobudi? Is he here? Yeah. He's, yeah, he, oh, he's here. Oh, I'm looking for you and you're just here. I should know you're next to your disciple. <laughs> but there you go, that's what he's just told me. I'm next to my disciple. You know, this man is probably one of the most educated people I know. Huh? But I've known him from when he was a young man. And I can tell you one thing I've loved about Joe. Joe is the hungriest person to learn I've ever met. Like, it's so easy to invest in Joe because he's just curious. Like, he wants to learn. Like, Joe, let me make fun of you because, like, there's a time you came to me. And Joe was like, Pastor, I'm, I'm a melancholy. Like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to, like, be attractive to people when they're coming into church. But I see you every Sunday. I want to stand with you and just learn how you do it. So the guy just came and he stood next to me. And I used to stand at the Hill City entrance. I was a Hill City pastor at the time. And I'd greet people. And I'd smile at them coming in. One day Joe told me, Pastor M, I finally got how you do it. I told him, uh -huh, so what do I do? <laughs> Joe went on to educate me how I greet people. He told me, the first thing I noticed about you, Pastor M, when you see somebody from a distance, you start smiling from there. Like already from that smile, they cannot avoid you. They already know you are welcome. You already, you've, you, they can't hide from there. It's like you're already beaming on them. And then, by the time they're coming close, you put your leg forward and you say, ah. By the way, I'd never noticed I do that. So you put your leg and you, you lean with your whole body. And then you hold their hands and you say, welcome to church. And, you, and it's like, and he just broke down and he's like, that's how, and he said, that's how I'm now doing it. And I watched him and he smiled and he's like, somebody else would have said, I'm a male. Me, I don't greet people. I don't know how to smile at people. I'm not a people person. Yeah. But somebody here said, I want to learn from somebody who's good at this thing. And I'm going to copy him until I become as good as what he is. And I watched, and he even became better. <laughs> By the way, he, he became an amazing usher. Like he was so good at greeting people and just making people feel at home. And yet it was not his natural disposition. This is why this man will always learn great things. Yeah. And he'll be a great man. Yeah. Don't 
be too proud to learn even the most basic things. Yeah, there are things you don't know. You can learn if you just make yourself teachable. So Moses says, come on somebody, look for teachable Joshua's. Look for teachable Joshua's. There's some people in your meeting, they look like they're actually learning. Not the ones who fold their hands and they're like, now when will this guy finish? Yeah? Look for those teachable ones. Those are the ones you want to raise up. And then Joshua's in the house. Come on, Joshua's. Be teachable. Be hungry to learn. Don't ever assume you know. By the way, you can learn from somebody who you never thought you could learn from. Just be hungry. Never be too proud like, oh, I'm pastor so-and-so. Uh-uh. I can learn. Even from somebody in MYF, I can learn. Even from a child in MK, I can learn something. If I just hang out enough and I'm curious, I will learn something from somebody. Number four, friendly. These are great qualities. It's interesting. We are told in Numbers 13 verse 16, these are the names of the men Moses sent to explore the land. So Moses picked 12 spies, each representing the tribes of Israel. And it says, Moses gave Hoshea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. Joshua wasn't even his, his name. It was his nickname. Like his leader gave him a nickname. Like you don't give a nickname to angry, funny people <laughs> who, will, who will get to, You have to be really close. You have to feel comfortable around someone by the time you're giving them a nickname. And, and, and you have to be comfortable enough in the relationship that you don't feel they'll be offended. Yeah. There's a, there's a closeness. This is the only person. All the rest are red. But it says about Joshua, this one, Hoshea, Moses called him Joshua. This is, you're looking for that person who, you, who enjoys being around you. Yeah. By the way, I, I, at some point as a leader, I realized begging people to like me is a lot of work. Praying that people like me is a lot of work. There are, not, there are some people, by the way, who will never like me regardless of what I do. <laughs> oh yeah, they're there. By the way, they're there. There are some people who will never like you regardless of what you do. So rather than using all your energy trying to make people like you, find the ones who like you. And work with those ones. They will be so much easier. People who you enjoy each other. Look for those people. People who don't take themselves too seriously. By the way, I, I, I told you Pastor Godman yesterday that I, he became my friend. And uh, I have a sneaky suspicion one of my other friends might be around. Is Pastor Atoms anywhere in the building? Because he had told me he might show up. If anybody sees Pastor Atoms, make sure he comes right here to the front. So how I found Pastor Godman is when I finally found that he was like, he had a church like Mavuno, I asked the people who know him, does he have a sense of humor? Like, is he an enjoyable person? Because, you know, you can be a, a, big, a pastor of a big church and you're the hardest person to be around. And I had to go to... When I was in Nigeria, I didn't even tell him. That's what I went to see. Is he somebody I enjoy? And I sat with him and his wife. Like, in 10 minutes, I already knew we'd be lifelong friends. Like, these guys lead a phenomenal church. I mean, if you go to their church, you'll be amazed. It's not, don't look at him humble as he is and look down on him. He leads an incredible ministry. But the humility, the sense of humor, that you can relax, sit down, forget titles, just be, ah, I, I could tell, this one will be buddies. Being pastors sometimes can be hard work, by the way. Because men of God, sometimes we can, we can get caught up with ourselves and our titles and our bodyguards and our protocol. <laughs> And, and it just becomes, and, and I have nothing against that, but I'm just saying sometimes you can become unapproachable and stop being somebody who's fun to be around. And you become a lot of energy to be around. But you know what? I love being around people who are enjoyable to be around. Yeah, they don't take themselves too seriously. You can laugh at yourself. Yeah, you can actually say, ah, I messed up. And we laugh and we continue. And you apologize and we move on. And I believe that's the kind of person you're looking for. Look for friendly people. Yeah, look for people who enjoy you and who you enjoy. Moses. Moses is in the house. Yeah. Are there some friendly people around you? Yeah. There's some people who are fun to be with. You enjoy being with them. Look for those ones. And also for you, be a fun person, Moses. <laughs> yeah. Let, do, do some fun things with your disciples. It's not just about being serious all the time. Like take people, hang out, enjoy. Give each other nicknames. Do, do fun things. But also for the Joshua's in the house. Ah. Enjoy life also. Don't be too serious. Enjoy your leaders. Find out what their hobbies are. 
sleeping. <laughs> he was like sleeping. <laughs> Pastor Kilonzi. <laughs> you can compare sleep notes. <laughs> Number five, tested. Tested. When Moses decided to send the 12 spies, the 12 spy had been Joshua. Numbers 13, 18, it says again, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, son of Nun. Of the 12, only two came back with a positive report. Caleb and Joshua. So, so Joshua had already proved himself to be faithful. He had already shown that he was a kind of person who could be trusted to give a positive report, to have a faith report. He had been given opportunities by Moses. And so this is what it's saying. When your people are around you, give them those opportunities that will show you who they are. Don't hold on to responsibilities. Some of the responsibilities you give, your, your disciples may not do them as well as you, but they will test them and help them become what they're supposed to be. So let them do other things. Share the load. Don't carry everything by yourself. And when you share, they become tested. You're able to see this one is faithful. This one has, this one has shown they can do it. Sometimes when you're not around, who's, who's going to lead? And, and maybe even when you're around, you can actually say, today I'd love you to lead for me. And I'd love to lead and then coach you as you lead. And just see. And you're able to talk later and say, oh, if you don't need to do this, do this. And you're testing. You prove the person is being proved. You want to create those opportunities for the people God has put around them. Put those small assignments. And by the way, let me just say this. Moses, create opportunities for your Joshua's to thrive. Give them responsibilities. And don't even, give them small, even small responsibilities. Give them. And Joshua's, Joshua's in the house. Don't despise small responsibilities. By the way, you will learn more from those small things than you could ever imagine. Pastor Carol and I, we thought we were babysitting our mentor's children. What we didn't realize is we're learning to be parents. Yeah, it changed our lives. Just babysitting people's kids. And I'll give you, I'll tell you what happened. There's some of them who had phenomenal kids. <laughs> Just being around them. And then there's one or two who had kids where you're like, hey, 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 how do we not have kids like this? So you learn both positive and negative, isn't it? We're like, what do we need to do so that our kids don't turn out like these ones? Even though the person is such a godly person, the kids have not turned out well. And it's like, what are these ones doing differently? Just by being in that space, our, our parenting was being shaped. And because when the lab course was written, Pastor Karo sat down and helped structure that. The parenting of many families was being shaped as these two interns were sitting babysitting children. So, so sometimes your leader gives you a small assignment and you're like, does he know who I am? I'm such a busy person. I have such, a, I have such high responsibilities. And you don't realize you're missing your opportunity to be tested for spiritual things and to become who God wants you to be. Number six, commandable. Commandable. <laughs> I've frozen at that point. Moses knew that Joshua would follow instructions whether he was around to observe him or not. He had seen that. Because in Deuteronomy 3.21, it says, At that time I commanded Joshua, you have seen with your own eyes all the Lord your God has done to these two kings. The Lord will do the same to all the kingdoms over, over, over there where you're going. It's interesting because Moses had instinctively knew, whatever I've told this man, this man will do. Whatever he has seen me do, he will also do. He's like, this man is commandable. This man is instructable. He had no doubt that this man would continue with his legacy. And that man was commandable. He was a follower. Look for those people who are willing to listen to instructions. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes we find that so hard. But you know, when I listened to Pastor Irene yesterday and the, the Diani um, covenant, I realized it could not have worked unless your disciples were commandable. Yeah, if they're all waking up when they want and praying what they want, you would not have seen the miracles you saw. So you might be thinking you're a nice person, by, looking, by, by saying, by excusing people who are just wanting to do their own thing, and you don't realize it, you're sabotaging the mission. And you're actually sabotaging their destiny as well. So look for commandable people, Moses. Look for those people who are ready to follow. And of course, for the Joshua's, you know what I'm going to say. Be commandable. Be commandable. Be that person who's able to say, here I am, send me. I'm going to do it. Anticipate the need and do it. And then the last one is affirmed. Affirmed. Joshua was affirmed. God affirmed Moses' choice of Joshua because he could see something in Joshua 
that was different. In Numbers 27 verse 18, the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua son of Nun, a man in whom is a spirit of leadership, and lay your hand on him. Like there's something, like all those things that we've talked about before had affirmed Joshua before God even. And God said, this one has the spirit of leadership. Out of those million Israelites, he said, this one, take him, lay hands on him, because he has the spirit of leadership. There's something, even God has affirmed that person. As you work more and more with a young leader, you are going to begin to sense God's affirmation in their life. And they may not even be a young leader, by the way, even an older leader. You're going to start to sense this one has God, God's affirmation there. There's some people you work with and you already begin to tell, this one is going to go places just because of their attitude. There's an affirmation that God even begins to put in your spirit. You see, God looks at, uh, but man looks on the outside. But God looks at the heart. Some of the things that you think make a good leader are not what make a good leader. Sometimes you think it's that person who can, who can shout and people, who talks and everybody listens. Who cracks the jokes and everybody in the group listens. Who everybody sees as a natural leader because they're charismatic. That's looking on the outside. Don't look on the outside. Look at the heart. These qualities here are what help you become a multiplying leader. When you begin to understand how to call out the Joshua's in your life and to raise them. Because Moses was able to raise a successor, his dream did not die with him, but continued into the next generation. I want to put it to you. Moses' leadership was great. He was the greatest leader of his time. He was an amazing leader, but his greatness would not be as great as what it was if he had not raised a leader who took over the promised land. So his greatness is cemented because of his successor. You're only as good as your successor. No success without successors. You just need to understand this. And guys, it's in every space you're in. If you're a DG leader right now, who are your successors? Who are the people, the two or three in your group that you're like, here are the people I'm grooming to be able to take over my role. If you're leading an office somewhere, who are my successors? Who are the young people that I'm investing in? Who will be able to help me move to the next level? Whether it's a ministry, whether it's even in your family, looking at your children and seeing them as your successors. Because we don't do that as Africans. We don't look at our children as our successors. Many times what people tell their kids is go and do all that you can do. Go be all that you can be. And the question I ask is, is there no anointing in your family that should be passed to the next generation? Yeah. I mean, our Asian friends know us, our anointing is we're doctors. So I tell you, go and do all that you can be, as long as you're a doctor. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and many times we think that's imposing their will. No, it's not imposing, it's discipleship. Because they started when those kids were young. Train up a child in the way they go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. That's what they know. But you see, for us as parents, because we don't have a vision as African people, we just tell our kids, go and do whatever you want to do, and they scatter. And you find a parent, I, I know so many parents who have great successful businesses in this country, but their kids live in every country in the world except here. And that business is facing death in the next generation. Or it will be sold and parceled out by people who don't care about the vision. Because we don't have successors. We don't raise successors. Ask your neighbor, who is your successor? Ask your other neighbor, are you raising people or are you using people? <laughs> yeah. This is a life and death issue, people. It is. It doesn't matter how gifted you are or anointed. It doesn't matter how big you're able to grow that ministry. God created you for lifelong and eternal impact. And if you don't raise people after you succeed, your ministry will die after you leave. Some of you today, if you leave the place you're leading, it collapses. P please, Okay, I don't know how to say this. I feel like I'm losing some people here. Are you with me? Yes. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yes. Some of you today, if you leave, the thing you're leading dies. Yeah. It, it will die. Because you've not prepared the people around you for your absence. You're acting like you will live forever. You're acting like you know the day of your death. Yeah? And so the thing will die because you don't understand that you're supposed to be a multiplying leader at every level. Whatever you start needs to have people who are going to take it over after you. And so your ministry is amazing, but your ministry is only amazing because you have an amazing gift. Yeah. And the minute that gift is taken away from the ministry, that ministry will die. Yeah. That's actually a very poor ministry. 
There are no success. There's no success without successors. Let me tell you what happens when you raise successors. Can I tell you what happens? Because we talked about the fact that, yeah, I might be kicked out. People might think that, uh, that I might become dispensable. Uh-uh. Let me tell you what happens. Number one, it allows for your growth. When you raise successors, you are going to find it's going to allow for your growth. If you want to become a great leader, raise, success, raise young people under you. Raise other leaders around you. Don't raise just followers. Raise leaders. Raise people who are like you. Disciple other people. You'll be able to have greater impact. You know what? Because Moses raised up Joshua. And Joshua could now lead the army. Moses didn't have to be leading the army. Moses could now be interceding. He could be doing what the 5% that nobody else could. Do you understand there's some things that you can do as a leader that other people can't? Yeah. As, as the leader who was appointed by God, he could intercede in a way that he could not delegate. Nobody else could pray for Israel the way he could. So he picked the one thing that gave Israel a competitive advantage. He moved into a place of prayer. And Israel won the battle because there were young people who could fight. Yeah. When, when you allow other people to take over, you step up into the next level of authority and responsibility. That's what happens. You don't actually become stuck. You actually step up. There's some people who are stuck at the same level. They will die as CEOs. A CEO is a very small position, by the way. Yeah, it's a very tiny position. Because you're leading one company, surely. One co How do you lead one company as a CEO? Seriously? You should be leading a group of companies. Yeah. A CEO is such a small person. You should be leading companies in all the nations. So when, when, you don't, when you fear to hand over, it means you'll never be promoted. You will never promote yourself. You stay stuck. So it allows for your growth. And when you point to others, you're able to move on to higher levels of responsibility, higher levels of anointing, higher levels of gifting. God can take you higher. You know, it's very interesting because several years ago, when I stepped down from leading Hill City, I, some people thought I was crazy. And, and we've had people tell Karen, now you guys are crazy. How do you hand over your largest campus? Like, what's if, like what, if, what if those guys take off with it? And how do you lead Mavuno and then you're not leading a company? By the way, do you know what that means? It generally means, because you know in a church, the economic engines of the church are the giving of the people. It generally means I no longer control any economic engine in Mavuno. I don't have a budget that I control. That Pastor James has a budget here. Pastor Kilonzi has a budget in his church. Pastor Victor has a budget in his church. Pastor Milton has a budget. For me, I, I requisition. I usually give them my budget. I say, I think I'll spend this much. And then they figure out how they'll make sure that I have my budget. I don't control Mavuno Church. And when I, gave, when I, when I quit that job, I thought, I mean, some, I, I actually used to wonder, how will I fill my time? Because I basically handed over the responsibilities. I gave them the key responsibilities of running this church. But guess what? I am busier today than I ever was. Because I realized as I stepped into that 5%, there are things I'm doing now that I could never have dreamt of doing. Simply because I was carrying the role that all these people are carrying over here. Yeah. But then when I finally, when I first did it, first of all, I was shocked to find that the job I was doing was being done by six people. Wow. It's not that I was that gifted. It means I was stifling it. Because if six people were now carrying it and all of them were having full-time jobs, it means I was, I was doing a very bad job because I'm not six people. Yeah? And that's what happens when you're holding on to leadership like this. You're doing a poor job. And when I handed it over, the job now was done properly. <laughs> but then what it did, it freed me up now to, become, to start growing. And I feel like the places I'm able to speak into right now, the authority I have in different places right now, I would never have had. I would never have had time to go to Nigeria and look for Pastor Godman. I'd never have had time to go and look for the other pastors who have now become part of my circle of friends, apostolic leaders, uh, who are impacting Africa and beyond. I would, never, I would not be in that circle. I'd be here signing checks. <laughs> There's nothing against signing checks. I'm so happy you signed the checks, by the way. Yeah, somebody has to sign the checks, you know. But you know, when you're signing checks, it looks like the biggest thing you can ever do in life. Yeah, at that point, you're like, hey, that's a big thing. I'm controlling a massive budget in this church. But guess what? When I release that budget to others, I'm freed up to enter into a space that none of them can, and they need me in that space. Because if I'm not, in, I'm not leading here, they can't grow. So release it. That thing will actually allow you to grow. When you get two, two leaders, when you get a couple of other leaders in your DG, 
and you start to grow and they plant, now you become an MC leader. Because you'll be leading a missional community of several groups. And now you'll no longer be even in charge of leading a group every weekend. You'll actually be every Wednesday. Now you'll even be visiting the, the three groups or the four groups that came out of your group. And you'll be a coach. You'll be learning new skills because at, at, at that level you're learning the skills of a coach. You would never have learned those skills if you are still holding on to that DG of yours. Yeah, that's how you grow as a leader, by handing it over. In your campus that you're leading, who are the people who are under you who are leaders? As you release that to them, guess what happens? You start to step up. Because now you have time to lead a network of churches. But as long as you're holding on to it like this, you will never grow. You'll never grow. That business of yours. You know, Pastor Carol and I led a business. She's, this woman is amazing at doing what I'm talking about, by the way. She's really taught me a lot. And I remember we led a business. Some of you heard me talk about our business, our media business. That by the time it was at its height, could, do, could shoot 30 weddings in a month and edit all those weddings and hand them back to the clients and even market for, first of all, market them, bring them in, shoot them, edit them, and send them out to clients. And that would be the month when we are on holiday. As in, none of those clients would even know who we were. Like the company operated well, even without us. And guess what? As you do that, you're even able to enjoy life. We could take leave. We had a business and we could go and leave for a month. I'm talking to a businessman in this house who has not been on leave for five years. Because <laughs> if you leave, you will not even pay rent. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, no success without successors. I hope in your mind you're seeing your successors now. You're clearly seeing who your Joshua's are. Number two, it increases your capacity. It increases your capacity. It doesn't matter how gifted you are. Your business will not be able to achieve and go to the places it needs to go to. Your ministry will not be able to achieve and go to the places it needs to go to if you're working by yourself. If you're struggling to achieve your job, you'll not be able to keep, you find yourself, uh, if you're finding yourself not being able to hand, handle your role, maybe your, your role is becoming overwhelming. Part of the reason could be that you're doing things you shouldn't be doing. That there are things you should have handed over by now that you're still holding on to. And you know, the interesting thing is I found when, when, I handed over responsibilities. My leaders had to stretch. They had to grow. Let me tell you guys, when I watch Pastor James leading prayer, I'm so proud. I'm so proud. I'm like, this man, I raised him. What? Because he's doing things I couldn't do. When I watch Pastor Milton teaching over here, I'm like, what? I'm so proud. They're carrying weight. I could, I, in fact, I look at it, I'm like, when I was in their level, I was not doing what they're doing. But part of it is also because there's somebody ahead of them who's helping them even think higher and think bigger. So you increase the scope of your ministry. Mavuno is able to do a lot of things now. We're managing 50 campuses. Ah, and I'm not dying. In fact, I enjoy my job. <laughs> I love it. And it's because other people are leading and carrying significant responsibilities. Sometimes we're afraid to trust people with significant responsibilities. And we don't understand. We are robbing them of the opportunity and we are robbing ourselves of the growth as well. So how do you grow your organization? How do you grow your ministry? Raise leaders. Raise your Joshua's. Ask your neighbor, who are your successors? Number three, it ensures the continuity of your ministry. You know, if your vision does not outlive you, your vision is not worth it. If your discipleship group dies when you leave it, that group was not led of God, by the way. If you leave your campus and your campus dies, maybe God, you had not had God in that calling. Yeah. It's not worth it. If your vision dies with you, it was not a God-sized vision. And that's why many of our African businesses are one generation wonders. Yeah, one generation and it dies. It just made money and then it died. That's not what a business is meant to do. You know, it's interesting because Joshua did greater things than what Moses did. He continued the legacy. God's people continued to worship, to take over territory. There was even, a, you know, Moses, Moses was a great lawgiver and guide. Ah, but Israel needed a warrior for this new season. And Moses raised the warrior that Israel needed. And because of that, Israel thrived even more after he left. They did greater things when he was dead than when he was alive. Let me tell you, if the thing you're leading does better when you leave, the world would say, ah, ah he was not a good leader, surely. How is it doing better now that he's gone? In the kingdom, I look and I say, that is a fantastic leader. That he left and the company actually grew. 
that man built a foundation. Yeah, that woman built a foundation. Yeah. When you're leading your DG, you should be thinking, by the way, by the time I leave this DG, it should thrive more than when I'm here. Yeah. When I travel other places, I should come back and find it has grown. <laughs> because I've built the capacity of the people around me. So it continues, it ensures the continuity of what God has put in your life. And you know what? I believe Mavuno will outlast me. Long after I'm gone, Mavuno will continue. And ordinary people will be turned into fearless influencers of society across this world. The vision I have is too big for me to see it in my lifetime. Some of our children are the ones who are going to achieve this vision, by the way. Yeah. And because of that, I can't stand in their way. I have to always be thinking about the next step. I'm already thinking right now, in the next three years, the things we are doing with Pastor Carol, some of these guys already need to be stepping up into those roles. So I'm already beginning to reinvent my career for the next three, after the next three years. 2025 can't catch me doing what I'm doing right now. Yeah. I need to be thinking ahead. This is not a seat that I'm sitting on for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah. Because this organization is bigger than my personal ambition. Yeah. And so think ahead for the things you're holding on and say, what am I doing? How, in the next five years, who will be doing what I'm doing? How do I need to be stepping up and raising them so they step up as well? Number four, it gives glory to God. It gives glory where it belongs. It gives glory where it belongs. You know, when you create that exit plan right from the start, I call it leading while leaving. It means that whatever I'm doing, I'm always thinking I won't be here always. By the way, this is not just for companies, huh? even for your family. Some of us bring up our children like we will never be. We'll always be there. Yeah. You know, when, when we, our, our poor kids, when they got 18, we had, told, we had been preparing them from when they were very young. We told them, you're going to leave the house when you're 18 and find a place to rent and start understanding life without the perks. You know, staying in your parents' house is very comfortable. Starting with free Wi-Fi. And food you never paid for. And some people have told us, you're very harsh parents. Why would you do that? But part of the thing is, I realize these kids need to be thriving even if we're not here. And after we're gone, they need, to be they need to be greater leaders than us. So right now, they can leave while we're still here so we can coach them. As opposed to telling them, stay in our house until we die. By the way, some of you have siblings who are in their 40s and 50s and have never left your father's house. Am I, talk am I, am I, am I preaching to some African in the house? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about. Because your parents had no vision to raise a Joshua. And so they, 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 they were Moseses. They did great things. But the people they raised are mediocre. And they thought they were being good parents. Sometimes we think we're being good parents. Oh, I don't want my kids to suffer the way I suffered. Uh-uh. That suffering is what made you who you are. Yeah. Paying rent is what made you who you are. <laughs> we need to understand this. It builds some resilience in you. So it gives glory to God. I want Mavuno and the vision of this church to be around Jesus and not to be around Pastor Moravi. By the way, I, I will consider myself successful if after I'm dead, people remember Mavuno and they don't remember Moravi. Yeah. I, I really want that. Please, don't build a shrine to me. <laughs> don't build a shrine. If you have a basketball court, you can call it the Moravi basketball court. That's okay. I wouldn't mind. But don't build shrines because this is not about a person. This is about the next generation being reached for the gospel. Ordinary people being turned into fearless influencers. That's what we want to see. And when I see you and I see your children in MK, my prayer is that they will love this vision as much as you love it. Yeah. That you will raise them up as your successors to carry on your ministry. That's why I'm so impressed by those who have your children here, by the way. Some of you have been sitting here with your children all day. And as Pastor Godman told us, they may not get everything, but there's a 10% that you'll be able to remind them and they will remind you and they say, but we learned this. There's something I picked about being a leader and I can see what you're doing at home with me. I now understand. I now understand why you're telling me to leave home at 18. Ha, ha, ha. God bless you. No success without successors. So let me give you, by the way, this word, God really gave me an urgency for it and just told me it's a word that's going to save campuses. It's a word that is going to save discipleship groups. It's a word that is going to save families, and it's going to be a word that is going to save uh, businesses in Mavono Church. Four levels of leadership. That's why, by the way, I've packed it. It's got quite a bit of content, but, but please bear with me because I think this is going to save and help. There are four types of leaders. 
The first is a positional leader. This is John Maxwell's stuff. Some of you know it. A positional leader. This is when people follow you because of your title or appointment. Position leaders are all about their title. Like, you should know I'm the pastor of this church. I love what Pastor Godman says. If you have to tell people you're a lady, you're probably not a lady. If I have to tell you I'm the movement leader, I'm probably not the movement leader. But positional leaders are all about the office. How dare they say that about me? Why are they thinking this about me? Do they know who I am in this church? Am I not your priest? Am I not your pastor? Position leaders are not fun to work with. People don't enjoy working with them. In fact, people are afraid of position leaders and they don't find them approachable. When people are position leaders, they use people to get the job done and people can sense it. People can sense it. When the leader calls you for lunch, the first question you ask is, I wonder what he wants. I wonder what she wants. What's the catch? Not because you believe they have. In fact, you know they don't have your best interest at heart. You know that they, they have something they want done and it's you they want to do it. You, then it's not about other people. It's about themselves. People do things for position leaders because they fear you. If you're a position leader, your people fear you. They follow you. And by the way, when you're a position leader, it can look like you really have a good thing because people are following you. But the thing that holds you together is fear. Fear. Am I frozen? Is somebody with me here? Yeah. Fear. And by the way, there are some people who came from positional families and came from positional companies. And when they come to church and they hear you talk the language of following, they immediately fear. Because they've come from fear environments. And any strong leader they've seen has always been an abusive leader. And so even this culture change, they struggle with it, not because the culture change is wrong, but because of what has been done. They've been messed up inside by the situations they've been in. This is what position leaders do to people. Number two is a permission leader. Permission leader. A permission leader is where you lead through love and relationships. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, when you're a position leader, you're much loved. People love permission leaders. Permission leaders are kind and generous. People enjoy being around them. And people follow you because they love you. Hmm, come on, it's such a sweet thing. It's like, I love my leader. I'll die for them. It's a good thing. It's awesome. And, and let me just say, if you're a position leader, you must begin to learn how to become a permission leader. It's a leader who helps people begin to feel, they feel welcome. They can come into your house. They enjoy that. You've created family. You treat people. People know that you like them, and they genuinely like you back. It's a beautiful thing. The only challenge with, position, with permission leaders is sometimes they don't achieve much because they're afraid to challenge people. They're afraid to lose people and challenge people. They, they don't lead their people to uncomfortable places, and growth only happens in uncomfortable places. So many times, the danger with permission leaders, and some of you are permission leaders, so I hope this is, you're hearing this. When you're afraid to challenge your people, and sometimes permission leaders, you can be permission leaders because you like to be liked. And I'm speaking as a, a recovering permission leader. <laughs> I like being liked, by the way. And so for a long time, I, you like me, thank you, Pastor Kilonzi. Somebody likes me in the house, you know? I like being liked. So when you like being liked, then sometimes you're afraid of challenging people to do something that they're not comfortable with. And even though you hear God saying, let's do this, you're like, hey, God, you don't know my people. You know, let me, let, me just, let me just be liked. Uh, my people don't wake up at 4.30. Let's, let, let me just be honest with you, you know. It's like, let me... Uh, okay, the guys didn't laugh at that one because... <laughs> too soon? <laughs> Permission leaders. Permission leaders. Number three is a production leader. Production leader. People follow you because you're a proven and competent leader with consistent results. And that's a completely different level of leadership. A production leader is not afraid to challenge people. They love people and people feel affirmed, but they also are good at getting the job done and getting a team rallied to do a job well. And people like being on a winning team. Nobody, doesn't want, nobody wants to be. The pro, you can be in a permission team where we all love each other, but we never achieve anything. So very soon you're going to find people getting disillusioned because permission by itself is not going to help us win. But production leaders win. And so you're going to see people, it's like, all I do is win, win, win. People just want to be in your team, you know. It's like, because all of us just want to win, win, win. We want to be in a winning team. And so production leaders, they know how to harness people. They know how to challenge people. They know how to say, let's go on mission. And people feel loved. 
and motivated and challenged at the same time. That's a great place to be as a leader. People, want, people do things for you because they admire you and they want to be like you. When you're, a, when, you're a, when you're a production leader, people are like, if I hang around this one, ah, man, I can see we're going to win. And, and there's something I love about this guy. They are, they are such a great leader. This lady is such an amazing leader. That's a production leader. Those working with a production leader will feel challenged and stretched, and they'll be proud to be in the A team. They'll be like, our team wins. We're such a great team. We win, and they love that. There's only one danger for production leaders, that a production leader can become so good at what they do that when they leave, this thing falls apart. Because production leaders often build it around themselves and their competency. Like everybody's around my team and we win. And they win so long as I'm leading. It's like those great coaches, as long as I'm there in the team, the team is winning. The minute I'm fired or I leave, that team never wins again. That's a production leader. They are phenomenal. They are admirable. You can make a documentary about them. But they're a production leader. And that's their danger, that the team is dependent on them. And that takes us to the last team, the last kind of leader, which is a prolific leader. The prolific, prolific leader. Prolific, other words include fruitful, plentiful, fertile, or abundant. That's how you define that word. This person is, is, is fertile. They're abundant. People follow you because they know who they will become. <laughs> They look at that leader and they say, if I follow this one, I will become. Jesus says to his disciples, come follow me and I will make you. And basically, Jesus himself is a fish of men. So he's basically saying, you follow me, you'll become like me. That's what he tells his disciples. And they look at him and they're like, yes, I'm willing to give up my life to become like you. And they follow him. That's a prolific leader. Prolific leaders are able to manage huge enterprises and huge responsibilities because they also develop other leaders. And so around them, they're surrounded by good leaders. They're not afraid to throw people into the deep end, <laughs> to kick them into the, sh the pool <laughs> with the crocodiles. <laughs> but you see, there's a difference between a production leader uh, uh, and a prolific leader. Production leader will throw you in because he needs the job done. <laughs> a prolific leader will throw you in because he wants you to understand you can get the job done. It's very different. The, the, he's always thinking about, she's always thinking, how do I raise this person to do what I can do? So they will give you stretch assignments, but it's not, yes, the organization needs it, but uh-uh, you're more important. And when you fail, they don't actually come and say, how could you fail? They come and say, wow, what did you learn? How are you going to do it different next time? Because they understand that the value here is not what your performance was. It was what you learned for the organization. Because next year, you're going to be doing it again. And I know next year, you'll do a much better job than you did this year. So they're always thinking ahead of the people that they're leading. That's a prolific leader, a level four leader. When a person is a level four, they don't just lead followers, they lead other leaders. And they're very easy to spot. Level four leaders are very easy to spot. How are they easy to spot? Because they invest in people, and those who follow them are great leaders. And you will see a trail of great leaders behind them. People they work with become great leaders. And they'll be able to say, this one's a great leader. He's now leading their own space. This one's a great leader. He's now leading their own space. It's very easy to see a level four leader. Come on, Papa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because they can see, I was developed and now I'm doing what he was doing. What she was doing. That's a level four leader. They invest in people. And there's great lead loyalty among the leaders they develop. And because of that, the vision endures long after they are gone. Because it becomes a vision of many other leaders. And their vision just becomes big. The thing is stretched because many other people, competent people, are now doing what one person was doing before. And that's a level four leader. Tell your neighbor, no success without successors. Was that a bit of a sobering assessment? Where do, you think, where do you see yourself right now? If you're really, really honest. Are you surrounded by other great leaders who you can point at around in other places that you've sent out? Or are you at the place where you're looking and you're saying, okay, I'm a great production leader, but I can see I'm, the people around me are followers. Nobody around me is a great leader. And when people get to a certain level in my leadership, they leave the organization because they can't, this organization doesn't have space for multiple leaders. Or are you a permission leader? People love you, they're always around you, but that network doesn't grow because 
it's just based on love and no challenge? Or are you that position leader who is still in the place because I'm the leader and they should know I'm the leader? And this brings me to the difference between Moses and Joshua. Because throughout his leadership, Moses raised up great leaders. You're going to read about the 70 leaders who he poured out the same spirit he had. You're going to read about the 12 spies that he delegated a huge important national responsibility. You're going to read about Joshua who was there along the whole journey that he worked with. He positioned his leaders for success and at the beginning of the book of Joshua he says be courageous, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people into the, Lord, the, the land the Lord promised us. Choose this day who you will serve as for me and my family we will serve God. Like after all his years leading Israel, he basically is like, you're on your own. Me, I know I've secured my family. You guys make your decision. Wow, what a different speech from the speech of his, the person who raised him. And almost inevitably, you're going to see a couple of chapters later in Judges chapter 2 verse 10. It says, after that whole generation had been gathered to the ancestors, Joshua... <laughs> First of all, that, yeah, Joshua and the people he was leading, the, the, the older people died. After that generation was gathered to their ancestors, the ones who won the battle, the freedom generation, he says, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Like in one, this man, there's no battle he couldn't lose. He fought all the battles and he won them. He established God's kingdom. He took over many, many nations and he won all those battles by faith. He was a great man of faith. But it took one generation for all that to be wiped out. Nobody remembered anything about God in that one generation. Why? Everything Joshua worked so hard for was destroyed. Even though he accomplished far more in his lifetime than Moses ever had, Moses will always be the greater leader. Because there's no success without successors. No success. Tell your neighbor, no success without successors. Yeah. So today we're going to be graduating 50, 50 successors for this ministry. There are people who have learned the things that I know that we've distilled into this course. Our prayer is that there will become multiplying leaders in ministry, in the marketplace, wherever God sends them. Our prayer is that they will raise great uh, altars for God, that they will go across the nations and represent Him wherever He sends them. Our prayer is that you will be more famous. My prayer is you'll be more famous than I ever was. My prayer is that you will accomplish greater things than I ever did. My prayer is that people will sing about you and your successors will be so proud. The people you raise will be so proud of you. My prayer is that people will know you. You will impact many and many will be brought to freedom because of you. That's my prayer. And my prayer lastly is that you will raise up many people who are even greater than yourself. Yeah. This is what God wants. This is what God wants from you. I bless God. You are part of the, I think right now, 200. Was it 200 that have gone through the boot camp? Uh, our prayer is 5,000. So by the way, if you haven't done the boot camp, it's a great place for equipping. Uh, we're going to start the next class in January. Get some information today. I thank God for the over 300 who've done. Actually, right now it's probably over 500 who've done our internship programs in our churches, the full-time internship programs. Any interns in the house? Let me just hear some noise from the interns. Yeah. That's the same internship program I went through as an intern 30 plus years ago that Pastor Kilonzi went through, that Pastor Milton went through, and still Pastor Caro went through, Pastor Vic went through, and still we're taking other people through it because we're raising, we want to raise successors for this ministry. This ministry will never be about a person. It will be about great leaders. And our prayer, my prayer is that you will all be greater leaders than the leaders you see standing over here right now. Far greater in the kingdom. You will achieve far greater things. That's the only way that this thing will actually glorify God and not be built around a human being. So tell your neighbor again for me, no success without successors. I want to pray for us as we move into the next part. We're going to have a, uh, our lunch and then we're going to do our graduation. 
but oh my goodness, actually that was my graduation speech. <laughs> that you remember what you're being trained for. But it's, also, it's also true for the rest of Mavuno. My prayer this year, by the way, is that all of you will multiply anything that is put in your hands to lead. Yeah. My prayer is that this church will not grow because of powerful preachers, even though God has given us powerful preachers. But your campus will grow because of multiplying leaders in those churches. That our groups are the ones that will, will multiply. Our small groups will multiply and bring people into the fold. Ah, we will have more people saved in our discipleship groups than could ever be saved in our pulpits. Because the work of God is not to be done by a few people at the front. It's for the whole body of Christ. You are all leaders in God's house. Every one of you. Some of you have become Christians in this gathering. I'm speaking over you as well. You will do greater things than the things you have seen me do. Yeah, because this is what God wants for you. That you will be greater than your fathers. This is God's desire for all of us. You will go to further places than anywhere Pastor Caro and I have ever been. By the way, that's our blessing. This is our blessing now. You go to places we have never even imagined would go. And do ministry in those places. You will preach to nations that do not know you. Yeah. Right now they are piloting the, Mizizi, the Arabic Mizizi. I'm so, I'm so excited about that. I'm so excited about that. Because it means that people in nations that I could never have entered will hear about the gospel. Uh-uh. You will do greater things than me. You will do greater things. You will speak in greater places than anywhere I've ever dreamt about. Your ministries will be greater than anything you have seen so far. Yeah. You, your children will do greater things than my children will be able to do. I speak that over you because this is a blessing of this house. You will be greater than those who raise you. And so, Father, I just want to pray for your people now that as we enter into this space, you'd give us just a sense of holy understanding of the responsibility of the people you've given us over. That all of us have responsibility over other people. And you want us to lead them well. Not to use people. Not to use people. But to build people. To use the resources you've given us to build people and not to use people. And maybe you're here and even as I'm speaking, you're, the Lord is bringing a confession to your heart. And you're saying, God, forgive me because I've used people. I've used people. Maybe you're even at the place where you're saying, Lord, I've chased away leaders something about me i've just realized as this talk was going on that somehow when leaders come close to me they it's like i chase them away i don't even know what it is about me but i need to grow and i can't understand i need your help and maybe this is you you need to just start asking god show me how i want to grow to be a multiplying leader somebody here is praying and saying god forgive me for living for a small vision that is all about me and yet you've called me to live for a, a global vision a kingdom vision making disciples across nations Come on, if this is you, just say, God, forgive me. I've lived for a small thing. I've wanted a comfortable life, a small life. But you created me for big things. And there's somebody here who's saying, Lord, forgive me for using people to accomplish my tasks. From today, I will use tasks to build your people. Father, thank you for every great leader who is being born in this house. Thank you for the amazing leadership of this fearless tribe, this fearless family. I thank you for the many young leaders who are going to be raised in this house who are going to do even greater things than our generation can even imagine possible. Thank you that, Lord, your work does not end with us. Your work will not end with us. The family of Mavuno will do greater things after we are gone than even now when we are here. I thank you that, Lord, there will be halls filled with people we can't even imagine right now because of our faithfulness as we pray, as we bring people into your kingdom, as we learn to be multiplying leaders. And Lord, as I look forward to what you have for us in this next year and the years to come, I'm praying that, Lord, you will lead us into a realm of fruitfulness we cannot even imagine. A realm of fruitfulness we cannot even imagine. That, Lord, we will stop being fearful. We will be those people who say, here I am, Lord, please send me. We're always looking at the thing that God wants to do and aligning ourselves with it. We're never holding on to our responsibility as if it's ours to own. We're always leading while living and saying, God, here it is. I'm raising leaders so that you can promote me to the next place. And the Lord will honor, will honor your ability to do that. And so God's people, I bless you now. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And God's people say it together.
Amen. Amen and amen.